Yeah, he started out, he he had a meeting with all of his staff and he told them to write down all the names of the drug dealers, the students that didn't do anything, all the troublemakers. These people are drug dealers and drug users. They have taken up space. They have disrupted the school. And he ha called an all school assembly and he had all of those students put on stage and then basically addressed the school and he said, they have harassed your teachers, oh, and they have intimidated you. Well, times are about to change. You will not be bothered in Joe Clark's school. Okay, thank you, Ken, um, for joining. Today, we're going to be reviewing the movie Lean On Me. Yeah, it, I'm going to be honest from the beginning. I struggled to watch it once. I really struggled to watch it the second time, which is normally I'd, I'll watch a film two or three times. First time is just for the pleasure of watching the film. Then the second time is I'll sort of take notes. And if it's a difficult, complicated film, I'll, I'll kind of watch it a third time. But I struggled with this film. I felt it was very much a paint by numbers film. It didn't do anything for me, unfortunately. It, I think the subject matter was interesting. But I think subject matters like this are always difficult when you try and translate it to film. It didn't work. And I, I didn't work. It felt it had this feel of what we would call a TV film, a, a TV movie. We used to get a lot of them in the 80s and the 90s. They were sort of time fillers. So they were relatively reasonable films, but which were never anything brilliant. And I really felt this film fell very much into, into this category of a TV film. Okay, well, thank you for being honest. I, when I suggested it, I hadn't seen it for maybe 20 some years. I had seen it probably soon, probably when I was in high school. And the film actually is about a high school. So the story starts out in New Jersey, in a small town. This particular high school has got the worst scores in the whole entire state. And it's in danger of becoming, of being taken over by the state. So that's what we call receivership. Actually, the stu story actually starts out, the first scene that you see is from 1967, where the character Joe Clark, played by Morgan Friedman, is teaching a history class. All right, the Magna Carta. It was a document guaranteeing rights, but the rights of whom? Ah, uh, Stacy. The aristocracy. So yeah, it's interesting that the, the this Joe is seen teaching history to, to, to pretty much, I think it's an all white studentage. Joe Clark is, is, as you say, he's teaching English. And he, he's actually teaching the Magna Carta, English common law, and he's doing this history lesson. He obviously gets fired at this particular point, removed, however you refer to it. And the last shot of him leaving is going down the hall. They can go to hell. Come on, Joe. This place deserves exactly what it gets. It then, as you say, comes forward 20 years, and it's changed quite dramatically from a very lovely school to hell and as you say they're, they're playing welcome to the jungle it is a place like i actually work in a high school and i'm like wow the high school i work in i feel very safe compared to this particular high school because there's like fights in the hall teachers getting assaulted <laughs> particularly unpleasant kind of place to be, I would say, and certainly not somewhere. I mean, I, do you think this was overly exaggerated? Because I, I I, couldn't get my head around this. I'm thinking, you know, yeah. The school so could I, not get this, could could not get this bad, or, or could it? I, I don't know. It, it, it seemed quite unusual or quite difficult for me to get my head around. I did at first, and I actually mentioned it to somebody that works at the high school that I work at, and he thought it was. And then I did a little research and I actually listened to a conversation recorded from two students on NPR. And it seems that it wasn't so mm. much exaggerated that that's the way it was, which is scary that there was a place where teachers mm. could be like assaulted like this. They ha you had drug dealers being let in to side entrances and fights all the time in the halls like that, that it wasn't a safe place. So yeah, absolutely. I, I thought possibly it was exaggerated and definitely feel like, wow, my school, although we might have, you know, fights could happen in, in a typical school day, like there could be three fights in my school, but they're quickly stopped. And, mm. you know, the students are sent out of the school and whatnot. 
I never feel unsafe in the school that I work in, but I would not step foot in that school for sure. I think I'd like to have several members of the SAS around me because I think that was one tough school. I mean, you, you do see, as you say, there there's drugs are being exchanged. There's guns being loaded or played with underneath uh, tables. It looks a, a pretty, pretty scary place to say the least. So at that time, the superintendent has a meeting with the mayor and he's with his the lawyer as well. I just don't goddamn believe it. I, I've got an election coming up and you hit me with this now. And they're telling the mayor how the school is in danger of being taken over. Well, sir, the state report came in from Trenton just now and we, well, actually they ranked the schools and we were last. And they say, well, there's only one person I think that, you know, might be able to do this. And they didn't want to hire this person because they, he was known as Crazy Joe. Oh, wait a minute. No, 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 not that nut. No, no way. It's the only guy I can think of. But they gave him a chance and they decided to hire him to try to turn the school around. When, when, when I was watching all of these scenes in this particular school, I was asking myself, how can a school fall so far down the ladder and get to this particular point that it's mob rule, it's riot, it's it's a, it's a, it's an incredibly unsafe place to be for for all students, for all the pupils at the school, but for those who want to to actually get an education, because obviously, you know, because of this minority, it, it had pulled the school right to the to, to rock rock bottom. Is this indicative of that particular era in American history or any ideas? So a couple things. One is that the whole separation, the segregation was illegal at that point with like Brown versus Board of Education, but it was still happening. As you saw, there was a white school, predominantly white, that turned predominantly black or African-American. Part of that is what we have called redlining, where there's something that's not official, but basically if you're if a family is black or latino and they try to get an apartment or house in a certain neighborhood they are not able to so the neighborhoods became more and more segregated and schools are done by neighborhoods right so that's part of the reason and then because of that schools are also funded by the town or the city primarily so if you have a town or city that has very low incomes you're having very low amounts of school money amounts of money that are funding that school so right. schools are not created equal like i know in other countries schools are equal finland for example all schools are the same they're all funded the same but not here and so it can be very much that even if kids want to go there to get an education they don't have a choice they're they have to go to school where they're where they're living and that's the choice that they have and so schools are not funded equal they're not equal here in the u.s kind of Pulling back from the, the, the politics and the history of this, Joe Clark, he was referred to as Mad Joe or Crazy, Crazy Joe. Crazy Joe, yes. Um, but, I mean, obviously, in, in the in, when the film starts, he's in a very sort of hippie-type dress at, at this particular school. But later, when he's re-recruited or when he's recruited to come back to East Side High, he's suited, he's booted, he's ve very well kind of, he has a, a lovely kind of look as a... As a a headmaster or whatever the, the reference is in the, in the US. And again, he's in a very white school. All the kids around him are all white. They're all sort of six, seven, eight year old. He's back into a, a very white school. It just seems, you know, <laughs> kind of slightly kind of odd yeah, kind of look. But not, I mean, not, why was why was he called Crazy Crazy Joe? I mean, what did he do to be called Crazy Joe? It, it is based on a true story. Mm -hmm. One, I don't know if we mentioned that. And he did, like, you'll see parts in the movie where he's he's carrying a bat and he calls himself a Batman. They used to call me Crazy Joe, but now they can call me Batman. He would go around, like, way of being a principal at that school was very much like a drill sergeant, which, doing a little research, he actually was a drill sergeant in the Army. Um, okay, and so okay. it was very much, do as I say, like, everyone working for me, you don't speak in a meeting, you're going to do as I say he would go around just firing people or, or suspending them for very little reasons. Like he would demote or fire his English teacher, which was very important. Like he needed to actually, part of the movie was that 
he needed to get their scores up to 75%. The whole entire school had to, at least 75% of the school had to pass the basic skills test. And he mm -hmm. had less than a year to do it. So firing the English teacher wasn't a smart move on his part. Mr. Clark, just what was that all about? They said no one moved during the singing of the school song. Now, if you can't understand that, find yourself another place to work. I'm not sure the whole thing about showing him almost like a hippie in the beginning. Not sure if that's accurately true. I kind of feel like the difference of having the school being entirely or primarily white in the beginning and then 20 years later showing it being diverse, very much black and Hispanic. I believe that's true, but showing him working at a at an elementary school that was primarily white, that was strange. I'm not sure that that makes sense, given that it was the same city. I mean, the, the one thing which sort of makes sense now, and the film does not allude to, is his history. If he was a drill sergeant, if he was ex-military, certainly he ordered people around. I mean, a, a rod of iron in terms of the way he dealt with people, both the, the pupils and uh, the teachers. I, I wasn't endeared to him as a character at all. I felt that because of his his he, the way he treated everybody, he definitely would have been off my Christmas card list. He definitely wouldn't have been invited to a party of mine. He didn't come across as the kind of person who I felt I could have a, a conversation with. So again, this this probably comes back to one of the reasons I think the film failed for me. This information, which would have been really useful to to set the scene for, for Crazy Joe has been left out. So you're just left with this, this image of this, uh, this head teacher, this, uh, this headmaster with his megaphone and he's, he just barks. Let me have your attention. Everyone quiet down. I want all radios off instantaneously. All radios off. And everybody all the time with his megaphone. That would have made more sense if I'd realised he was a drill instructor, but not, not having introduced that, we haven't built this character. We haven't got any backstory for this character for Crazy Joe. So it, it now makes a little more sense. I mean, obviously, as we go through the film, you do, well, I did to some extent, I kind of began to understand that his desire for the children to, to, to kind of progress and to at least get this minimum mark was very, very strong. And he would do pretty much anything needed to get these kids to the point where they could at least get out into society and, and and succeed by having a basic level of English, basic level of maths and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, his methods were, I think there are quite a few dictatorships would have probably learned from this guy in terms of in, in terms of total inability. I mean, he couldn't have worked in the uh, the diplomatic court at all. <laughs> he would have started World War Three, I think. Yeah, he started out, he he had a meeting with all of his staff and he told them to write down all the names of the drug dealers, the students that didn't do anything, all the troublemakers. These people are drug dealers and drug users. They have taken up space. They have disrupted the school. And he ha called an all school assembly and he had all of those students put on stage and then basically addressed the school and he said, they have harassed your teachers, oh, and they have intimidated you. Well, times are about to change. You will not be bothered in Joe Clark's school. He kicked them out of school, mm. like they're done. They're not going to be here anymore. And everyone in the audience, you don't want to be that person. Now, you do yeah. say he was almost like a dictator, but I think to the students, he wasn't. Like you did, I mean, I did see. I'll say I saw a kindness or a caring for the students that it came across, especially with Kanisha, which was the student that he had known since she was in elementary school, where he would do a home visit to try to repair a relationship between Kanisha and her mother. Like he really cared about the students and I could see that. If we helped you find a job, a better place to live, would that help? Because frankly, I don't see Kanisha making it without you. And I could see the students actually caring about him. But I think it was the staff that he wasn't working well with. There was a point that Miss Levias, who was his assistant principal, basically called him out on it. I thought I could take it because I had a father in the oh. same kind of pain that makes you such a bastard. But I was wrong. Life is much too short. I will not endure you any longer. One thing I do want to also bring up is that so he on the first day, he kicked out 300 students. This school had probably 3,000 students. So that's huge. The school I work with, work for, has about 1,200 students. 
So this is a really, really big school. And probably another reason why there were not just the fact that you, it was in this neighborhood where there's all kinds of crime and people smoking crack and all that kind of stuff, but that it was such a large school, probably really hard to probably like manage all of the behaviors mm -hmm. in the school. But after he kicked them out, there were parents that of these students that got kicked out that were protesting and they had a meeting that night and he kind of insulted them. They say one bad apple spoils a bunch. Well, what about 300? He mentioned that they should get off of welfare. Go get your families off welfare. Dare you talk to these people Give about our welfare. children some pride. And he makes an enemy of this Leona Barrett who had one of the sons was kicked out and she was like, he shouldn't be kicked out. These kids want to learn. They need to be in school. So he made an enemy of her. So she's been working mm. through the movie, through the whole story to have him kicked out. Yeah. I, I kind of noticed that it was, I mean, if we go back to the theme I've used on other films that our main protagonists, obviously it's, it's, it's Joe is our main protagonist. We have Kenesha who, who kind of comes in this Mrs. Barrett kind of drops in. And obviously we have the mayor, we have the what's it called, superintendent of schools, yep. I think, on my notes. And then we have this legal guy as well. And the, the guy from the fire department. Again, coming back to this, this guy from the fire department, his hat's too small. It just, it, I just was not convinced by the background artist and most of the background actors. I, I really felt at some particular point, if I'd, if I'd cut them in half, I'd be counting rings. The acting was as wooden as it gets. I was not convinced by, yeah, I was just not convinced by a lot of the background actors. Now you were saying something about the flat, a lot of the students, a lot of the pupils were actually background artists who got involved in the film. Yeah, a lot, there of were a lot of the background um, yeah. actors were students from Eastside High. So but again, I mean, just coming back to, to kind of creating characters, this, Mrs. Uh, did you say it was Barrett or Barnett? I can't remember. Barrett, I think. Barrett, I believe. Yeah. You just left with this impression of a very well educated woman who just has or can't see the faults of her own child. And, but there's no, again, we, we don't have any relationship between her and her child. People yeah. are sort of drop, people are dropped into this film. And you kind of expect it to know about their back history, and there is no back history. There is no. So I was, I was kind of again within that first meeting. There's a lot of heckling, there's a lot of shouting, and there's a lot of people just sitting there with their mouths closed, and my head's just going, "This isn't it. This isn't equating at all. The pictures and the sound don't equate. They're not the same." So I, you know, again, I'm just coming back to my initial thoughts on this. I just. I had no empathy, empathy for any of the characters. I didn't feel any of the characters, for me, were real. They were all just very, very wooden and very difficult to believe. And I think if you don't believe in the characters, if you don't believe in the people on the screen, you find it very difficult to, to follow the storyline and to be convinced by the storyline. Yeah. Um, and yes, yeah, this, this woman keeps kind of popping up and she seems to have this incredible dislike for Joe. And she, she tries to be manipulative towards the, the mayor, fire chief, and the, 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 the whole system of how schools are, are financed. It, it wasn't absolutely clear because obviously not having, not being American and not having a greater understanding as to how schools are financed in the US, I was slightly picking at straws as to how all of these people came together. That, 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 yeah. Again, that's just me. Kind of circling back to the fire chief, the whole reason he came and got involved is that there's a scene where, you know, he kicks out all these students, all these drug dealers and whatnot, but there's a scene where one of the students is letting in through the side door. So the, the, the yeah. side doors of schools are locked Mm -hmm. Only the front door would be open, but there you can just open them to get out, obviously, because in case of yep. fires or emergencies. So there's a student that just lets in a drug dealer and that drug dealer ends up beating up a student in the school. And so yes. Joe orders that because the school doesn't have money to 
to get the security doors that would have alarms go off if they were open, mm -hmm. that he's going to have them chained from the inside, which yeah. is not a safe thing to do. But at the same time, oh. <laughs> he's got drug dealers that are being let in that are attacking his students. So he has these these doors chained and Miss Barrett keeps on trying to get the mayor to send the fire chief to go inspect it. And he's, he's basically blocking that fire chief. You need to get a warrant. You can't just come to my school whenever you want. And so he comes up with this whole plan that if the fire chief does get into the school, that he's going to have people call him on the radios and he's going to have people take these chains off the doors. So that's the whole thing, like her trying to get him, get mm. him fired, get him out of the school and get someone else. Yeah. Which is the lesser of the two evils, children feeling unsafe, the students feeling unsafe or the doors being locked. And I, you, you're right. I mean, there is reference on a couple of occasions to the fact the money isn't there for these alarmed security doors to be installed therefore negating the need to have these doors chained. I mean, again, one of these typical traits in these kinds of films, especially of certain eras, is the music montage sequence where all of these doors are being locked and they're all being towed after the, after the, um, the, the padlocks being put on. I, I kind of get that, but what I, the, you know, I, I, I'm not sure what the legal situation is in the UK. I think the, there are certain people who have access regardless and that will be the fire brigade in the uk they have access because they have priority so it wouldn't be the, the head of the school who could deny permission for them to I'm enter too. i don't think our principal could keep the fire chief out the film is it's, the, the plot's very very simple at the end of the day it it there's it's this is not a rocket science plot and it's not a difficult plot to follow i did struggle on occasions to actually grasp everything which was being said there were a few occasions when i thought didn't quite catch that. Had to skim it back to to rewatch. So you know that that for me would be something as a as a as a as a non native listening to this, you may struggle occasionally with the way things are said. I mean, that's one again one of the one of the tiny things I, I noticed. So I mean, obviously we have this situation repassing, re going over what was being said. He does seem to care very much for the pupils of the school, and it's seen a again and again he's saying to them look i'm here from like six in the morning if you've got any problems come and see me come and have a chat i'll help to deal with this and it's not with kanisha it's it's, it's also with other people there's a there's a young girl on the phone trying to speak to her baby um, or get in touch with a person who's looking after her baby the phone's not working he takes her and, and puts her in the office and said make sure she's able to to, to speak to whoever it is so he, he obviously has a great concern for for his students for his pupils get the best for them the plot very much seems to be him as the the headmaster the head teacher and the fight he has with the authorities who seem to want to have a school which doesn't go into receivership but don't want anybody to buck the trend in terms of or oh, how do you how would you put this to to create problems for the state to create problems for the local authority to for the mayor so that I mean that's probably the biggest part of the story, uh, and then obviously you have the we would call it PTA P Parent Teachers Association or the parents and this particular Mrs Barrett in particular who who just seems hell bent on causing trouble. She's she's in, she comes across again as a quite an unpleasant kind of person who doesn't have the interests of all of the 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 pupils the students. She just seems to have. She just seems to have taken exception to to Joe and will do anything to to take him down, to take the school down. So she's actually not the PTA. She's actually got herself on the school board, which is a lot stronger position. It's an elected okay. position, but she got herself appointed by the mayor, basically threatening him because he wasn't very popular. And she's like, I will basically get a bunch of people and we'll vote against you. You're not very popular. So. Clark can't even get them past that test. Look, I thought we'd settle And now with mess. the doors chained over there, that school is a fire trap, and your fire chief agrees. Son of a bitch is laughing at us, Don. Don. She got herself onto the school board, and the day, either the day of the test or the day after, like, they ended up taking the test, and the mayor wanted to be sure that Joe stayed in the school until the test happened, because he wanted to make sure that they passed. So right after the test, basically, he got the, the fire chief into that school and caught. And your problem is your mouth. Colton! Colton, it's a dump lock! Get those chains off the doors! The enemy's here! The doors all got to lock, Mr. Clark. 
Cuff them. And they were going to have a school board meeting that night to basically vote to fire Joe. So he's in the jail. They're having the school board meeting. And the actual lawyer for the city, Mr. Rosenberg, he actually taps mayor and he says, you not call the question. All points there. there. We cannot call the question. It seems that Mr. Clark's students have assembled outside in an exercise of their First Amendment rights. How many? It looks like all of them. So the mayor goes down. The, the jail must be right below the courthouse. And he says, you need to tell the students to go home. They're going to get, it's, it's dangerous. Like there's so many students, I'm going to have to call in authorities. Like you need to tell them to go home. And he says, I don't have to do nothing but stay black and die. Oh, if I'm crying out loud. And this is, this is the sequence where these thousands of students are all kind of hanging around the front shouting and the police start to come in. It's quite intimidating. You can see that. A, a situation could be created because of the way the police are coming in. I really felt at that particular point that potentially there was going to be a riot of some kind. They were, you know, this kind of in, in, that was an intimidating kind of scene. It's just in the background, but you know, you, you do feel like there's a problem arising. Joe finally decides to go out and tell his students to go home. Right when he's about to tell them to go home. His vice principal is coming through the crowd and she says, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have something. Please read this. And it's basically a letter from the state saying that the students had passed or at least 75 percent of them had passed. So, so basically he said, Mr. Mayor, on behalf of myself and on behalf of the students of Eastside High, you can tell the state to go to hell. I just felt there was no a, not a lot of drivers for this film. There's a lot of the smaller bit part actors. There's a, a little boy called Sam, I think. Yeah, Sam. Um, who was one of the kids who was expelled. He tries to get back in. Joe takes him up the roof and says, jump off or continue taking, you know, literally commit suicide, jump off the top of the roof or continue taking cocaine and drugs, et cetera, et cetera. No, I don't want to jump. Yes, you do. You smoke crack, don't you? He's one of those characters which I think, along with uh, Kanisha, who the only kind of students you really have any connection with. But yeah, so he takes him up to the top of the roof and says, jump off, commit suicide now, because you'll die within a year. Or, you know, if you continue taking drugs and this little kid says, yes, I'm, 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 I'm going to turn myself around. I'm going to become a good student. I'm going to pass. And I think there was another student as well with something. Oh, the, the young student who was beaten up when the drug dealer came in. Same kind of thing, uh, Joe says. Dropping out on me, huh? I'm not dropping out, I'm moving on. I got You'll be I dead want. in a year, son. You hear what I'm saying? You'll be dead in a year. Only way to turn yourself around is to stay in school, is to get an education, is to pass your exams. But I mean, yeah. there, there aren't that many real characters I could really latch on to. I just vacuous, I'm afraid. I'm terribly sorry particularly vacuous and it could have been a good film that's okay i mean i i like i said i had suggested it after not watching it for like probably more than 20 or 30 years so um <laughs> well, I, I do still see 35 some parts year of it old. that i like i guess i really like morgan yeah. freeman he did an excellent job he actually did shadow joe clark to kind of get a feel for him so that mm. was pretty interesting to me so but i i think it's definitely not one of my favorites <laughs> I think it's a film which which has not te um, stood the test of time particularly well. That's all I can say. So sorry to be so brut brutally honest about that film. And the worst thing was, obviously, as you were aware, getting a hold of a copy of this film did not prove to be that easy. I ended up getting an American copy of that film. So it's obviously my turn to choose another film. And again, this is this is based upon real life. This is based upon true events during World War Two. And this is about the story of Alan Turing, who was the main protagonist in helping to break the German codes and to some extent create the first computer, programmable computer. So it's called the uh, the imitation game. Now, whether. Oh, look at that. Brilliant. Yeah, that's good. So, yeah. Um, so. Hope you hopefully you will enjoy this. Hopefully we won't be as damning about this film as we have been about 
lean on me. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing the whole entire thing for sure. Brilliant. Okay, well, until next time, um, happy viewing. Thank you.